Hello, and welcome everyone to our course, Happiness for Teachers, or also known as Evidence-Based Happiness for Teachers. I want to apologize because my voice is not quite back from a little bout of COVID, uh, although I think I'm going to be 90, 95% of normal, which is pretty good. I'm the primary instructor as along with Nancy Berg, and Nancy and I will be the ones with whom you interact with regard to the papers and assignments that you turn in via Moodle, which I hope you all have already started to enjoy. I say that with some sarcasm because I have sometimes rever reverted to using the wor word Moodle as profanity when I'm really angry. I'll yell, oh, Moodle. Uh, on the other hand, I've become a little bit attached to Moodle, and I like a lot of things about it. It does have a few quirks, and sometimes we will run into those quirks. And if you run into any quirks on Moodle, on in, in terms of anything related to this course, I hope that you will contact us in order to get the information that you need. So my name is John Summers Flanagan. I want to say thank you to uh, Nancy, as well as thank you to the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation. The Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation, AMBFF, is really the reason that we're able to offer this course for such an inexp inexpensive price. Um, and we are very grateful to them for their support of this particular program and this particular project. I also want to say thanks to the Montana Happiness team. There will there are, are various videos that you'll watch throughout this course, uh, some of which feature Dylan, some feature Lillian, Nancy, and Emily. Uh, I don't think we have any with Dan, but there are other people involved in the Montana Happiness Project, and we're just really grateful to have a team that is fun to work with and that can help promote happiness throughout Montana. To start, those of you who are here in your chat box, if you're willing and you don't have to, but you could post your name, your school district, your role, and maybe something distinct or interesting about you. Could be a little signature statement, could be something that is just interesting that you feel like sharing. But of course, as with everything in this course, you can always pass. Also, if you're so inclined, type in one idea about a goal that you have related to taking this class. And it doesn't have to be a perfect goal. It just has to be the thought or the beginning of a goal or something you wanna just move toward because we will be focusing on goal setting a bit later. And so we'll have a chance to refine whatever it is that you're wanting to move toward in your life. <clears throat> I would also like to say, for those who are watching this as a recorded video, I hope you also think about ways in which in the discussion board, in the Moodle platform, I hope you can also share some things about yourself and your role and things that are unique or interesting about you. And I also hope that you will be able to feel comfortable sharing some goals and thoughts that you have related to things you would like to accomplish. Now, I would like to begin by telling a little story about this technique that we call the three-step emotional change technique. It's sort of jumping into content right away uh, and it's a story that goes on for a little while. And so please bear with me. I will talk as quickly as I can. But one of the points that I want to make about this story, one of the reasons I tell this story, is that sometimes people think that if we're doing happiness, we are also doing toxic positivity, that we're doing, uh, that we're encouraging or telling people that they should smile more or that they should cheer up. And I want you to know right from the beginning, that is not what this course is about, not at all. Even though happiness is in the name, we'll get uh, into the details and the weeds around happiness in a few minutes. 
for now, I want to tell you that I'm a clinical psychologist, and I'm also a professor of counseling at the University of Montana. And many years ago, I had a full-time private practice in Missoula, Montana. And I ended up, even though I wanted to do health psychology, I wanted to help people who had blood pressure problems or asthma problems or other kinds of medical conditions that could benefit from psychological interventions. That was really my dream. When I moved to Missoula and I was in full-time private practice, all I got for referrals were challenging young people. All different ages, uh, from about six to 19. And some of them were very angry, but the main thing I noticed that in, in addition to the anger, the big issue that faced me and them in every session was that they were often in a bad mood. They were in a bad mood and I knew enough from my long ago taken course in social psychology that mood is essential to learning. Good moods, we learn better. And when we're in better moods, we also are in many ways better people. We're more helpful, we're better problem solvers we're more creative. And so uh, I would try to figure out how can I lift the moods of the young people with whom I was working? So I developed this thing that I call the three-step emotional change trick. But the first part of this thing was for me to say, and I want you all to think about this as you hear this process. I would say to everyone, and so I'm looking out there and I might say to Liz and Don and Katie, I might say, have you ever been in a bad mood? And I would say that to my teenage or preteen clients, and they would all say, yes. In fact, often they were in a bad mood when I asked them that. And I would say, yes, me too, me too. Everybody gets in bad moods. And then I would ask them, has anyone ever told you to cheer up? And they would say, yes. And I'd say, don't you hate it? Don't you hate it when people tell you to cheer up? And they'd be, yes, I hate it so much. And we would, we would join on that because I think that is ridiculous. Telling someone to cheer up is universally, I think as universal as anything, unhelpful. It often makes people feel more upset and puts them in an even worse mood. And so then I would say to my young clients, I'd say, I want to promise you one thing. I will never tell you to cheer up. And I think for them, it was a relief. Uh, it was a relief. I was not going to tell them to cheer up. And, you know, sometimes I'd almost see a little breath of relief. And I would then say, okay, but how about this? Have you ever been in a bad mood that went on longer than you wanted it to? Have you ever been in a bad mood? Maybe it was anger. Maybe it was sadness. Maybe it was you were scared, whatever the mood or the emotion was, have you ever gotten stuck in it? And every kid I ever asked that of said yes. I sometimes, it sometimes just goes on and it's hard to get out of a bad mood. So then I would make my pitch and I'd say, well, if you want, I can teach you the three-step emotional change trick and then if you want to, you can change your own mood. You can do it yourself. You don't have to do it if someone asks you to or tells you you should. You can just do it if and when you want to change your mood and be feel a little bit better. Every kid I ever presented that to, and of course I was obviously um, pitching this in a way that would get me a yes, and they would always say yes. And I would say, okay, ready? Step one. I want you all to imagine that we're in a room together and step one is honor the emotion. And then I would ask everyone in the room or I would ask the client one-on-one, -on -one, what are some ways that when you're feeling sad or angry or scared or guilty or whatever the feeling is you're feeling, what are some things you do to honor it? And I would get all kinds of interesting answers. 
Um, oftentimes anger was, they would say things like, I, I yell or I scream in a pillow or, and I would say, well, how, you know, have you ever like written something and then ripped it up or ripped up paper? Or of course, I'm trying to coach them to use methods that are not destructive expressions of emotion. We would talk about if you're sad to cry. Um, and one time, and sometimes in the process of honoring the emotion, I would take my clients and we'd stand in front of a mirror and in, in, we'd stand in front of the mirror <clears throat> and we would make faces that were consistent with whatever bad mood the young person was in. And I remember one boy, I was, uh, in, you know, standing in front of the mirror and we're both doing our best to make the most angry faces that we could make. And I'm, I'm into it and he's into it. And he looks at me in the mirror and he looks at me and he says, you don't look angry you look constipated, which of course was hilarious. We both laughed. Uh, I said, I, just, I guess I'm not a very good actor. He, you know, and he laughed, he thought he was funny. And so what happened in that moment was we moved from step one to step two. We made a little bit of a shift. Now, the thing I like to emphasize in this class and with any group and with any client is you don't have to move to step two unless you want to move to step two, unless you're ready to move to step two. Because step two is to move past honoring the emotion. We honor the emotion, we express the emotion because it comes from somewhere. In some ways, emotions are perfectly rational, right? They're rational. It's, it's not like you feel emotions out of nowhere. You're feeling it it's important, we need to honor the message, but then when we're ready, we can move to step two. Step two is to think a new thought or to do something different. It's very simple. It's basically cognitive behavior therapy. And so I would ask the young people, what do you, what do, you do? What do you do when you want to feel better? What do you do that you think could put you in a better mood? What do you think that might put you in a better mood? And so we would talk about that. And I remember kids telling me jokes. And I have a couple of jokes that I would always tell the kids that I was working with. Um, and sometimes they would tell me stories and they would be funny stories and they would be not very funny stories. But the fact that they were stories that were an effort to get out of the bad mood and into a better mood, I would listen one time I was doing this with a whole fifth grade class in Missoula. And one little boy said, I just go in the bathroom and I smile in the mirror at myself. And such a cute kid, such a cute smile. And, uh, and you could just feel how that would change his mood when he wanted to. One little, one little girl says, I, I take my cat and at the time, I was working with lots of young people who had a long track record of delinquent behaviors. And so the idea of the kiddo taking a cat when they're in a bad mood and want to get in a better mood was a little frightening to me. And so the, the, she, she, took, she said, I take the cat and I go upstairs and I'm, I'm scared she's going to throw the cat out the window and she's going to tell the whole class. But instead, she says, and then I have a hamster and my hamster is pregnant. And so I take my cat and I'm uh, really scared at this point, like she's going to say something terrible, like she feeds the hamster to her cat or watches it anyway. Bad thoughts were going through my mind, but she just said, I put the cat on my head and then I sit in front of my hamster's cage and I watch my pregnant hamster with my cat on my head and I feel better. I love that story and I love to share it because I never would have come up with the idea of the cat on the head watching the hamster in the cage technique for getting in a better mood, but she did. And it illustrates how we sometimes need to use our own methods that we come up with. Now, the first homework assignment in this class is called Music and Mood. And it's the, the assignment is all about how do you use music in step two 
if you want to feel better, if you want to improve your mood, how you might use that to help improve your mood intentionally when you're ready. <clears throat> the last thing I'll just share with you is the joke I used to tell because a lot of the young people I worked with were a little angry. And I probably wouldn't tell this to the kids that were under 11 or so. But the joke is, um, why did the ant crawl up the elephant's leg for the second time? You're supposed to say, I don't know why. And I say, because it got pissed off the first time. <laughs> Which, of course, is a great visual image. And I am I still think it's a funny joke. So that's step two. Think a new thought. Do something different. Do something that you believe will help you get in a better mood. The third step is really important because... Life is interpersonal. We're in relationships. We're connected to other people. So step three is to share the good mood. You know, just share it in whatever way is reasonable, except you cannot share it by telling someone to cheer up. That is completely off limits because we don't do that. Instead, you might share it by smiling at someone, by holding the door for them, by, by cooking them a meal, by listening to some nice music with them. Uh, by doing them a favor. Uh, and we would talk about all the different things that people can do to share the good mood. I encourage you to do that right now. Just think about what do you do to share the good mood when you're in one? <clears throat> one of the things that's true about moods and emotions is that they're contagious. And so it it is possible for us to spread the mood to other people. And this is one of my favorite parts of the three-step emotional change trick, and that is step four. And whenever I would introduce that to my <laughs> challenging young clients, uh, they would object. They'd say, you said it was a three-step technique. And I would say, it is. But because emotions are so complicated, we have a fourth step. Emotions are complicated. Most of us as adults still struggle with emotions. And the big ones we struggle with are guilt and sadness or depression and anger or irritability uh, and, and fear, uh, anxiety. So the fourth step is to teach someone else the three steps. Again, along with telling them, this is not me telling you to cheer up. It's me teaching you the three-step emotional change trick, which you can use on your own when you want to. And so really, that's the essence in many ways of this course. Everything we do when it comes to the interventions or the active learning assignments in this class will be step two. It's a lot about step two. Think a new thought, do something different, different. engage in an evidence-based happiness practice. Examples include acts of kindness, Gratitude, best possible self, things like that. I'm now going to shift back to a little bit of history because I'm a university professor, and that means a couple of things. One is it means that I love the University of Montana, go Grizz, but it also, it means that I think it's good to look at things in context and to look a little bit at history and to talk about, well, so, so what is this thing we're doing? Where does it come from? Where does evidence-based happiness come from? Did you just make that up, John? Well, sort of. I made it up based on something that exists, however. So in the beginning, psychology spent about 100 years, actually more than 100 years, mostly studying, and I like to ask this question because most of us ask it of ourselves, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with us? What are the pathologies? What are the illnesses? What are the mental disorders that we might have? What goes wrong with people? Psychology, we have been so good at studying that. I got my PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Montana in 1986. I was so well trained in diagnosing anxiety, depression, suicide. Well, it doesn't take a diagnosis, but it takes assessment. OCD, ADHD, ODD, PTSD, a lot of different alphabetical terms that we use to describe mental disorders. Freud, being so negative, used to say that the goal of psychotherapy is to shift from neurotic misery 
to common unhappiness, <laughs> which what kind of goal is that? Not a very, not a very motivating one, I suppose, though common unhappiness is better than neurotic misery, but it's not a great goal. The goal of psychology and psychotherapy in those years, and it still continues today, is to help people become more aware of their problems, help people become more aware of their deficiencies. And then I have here, and then feel frustration in their efforts to change them. Well, that's it's true. One thing we're not good at in psychology is getting rid of negative behaviors. We're really bad at getting rid of anxiety. We're really bad at getting rid of depression. Now, even though those mental disorders are quite responsive to psychotherapy, but it's not because we attack them and say, you should stop. We need to get rid of the depression. It's really what helps people who are depressed and what helps people who are anxious is to build skills, build strengths, grow resources, to focus on making the health and the well-being bigger so that because we we can't get a get we can't get rid of all of our negative thoughts. You're gonna have negative thoughts. And so really a lot about depression treatment is coping with the negative thoughts that we know will come. They will come. They will get triggered. And it's almost impossible to make it so that we don't have cascading, difficult anxiety or depressing thoughts that plague us from time to time. We're, we're pretty good, though, at building skills, coping skills, strategies for dealing with the negative parts of human experience. Way back around 2000, a guy named David Myers did a study of 23 years of research. Actually, that's 33 years of research. <laughs> Excuse me. And he found that the overall ratio of articles published on negative phenomena in humans was 21 to 1 over the positive. So you can see there, he found 54,000 studies on depression and 1,700 on happiness. He found 41,000 studies on anxiety and 2,500 on life satisfaction. So you, you kind of get the feel there. This was what we were studying and we were studying it really well. Uh, and I'm not complaining about the fact that we did a good job of studying what's wrong with people. You might wonder why, why were things so imbalanced? And I think Charlie Brown, speaks to this in this cartoon when he says, sometimes I lie awake at night and I ask, where have I gone wrong? Then a voice says to me, this is going to take more than one night. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then what happened? In 1998, in San Francisco, a guy named Martin Seligman became the new president of the American Psychological Association. And in his presidential address in San Francisco, and a little historical anecdote, I was there. I remember listening to Martin Seligman, and I remember scratching my head because Martin Seligman was a bit of a crank. Uh, he had a history of doing some terrible research, some of which you may have heard of, which was the research on shocking dogs with electricity in order to establish his, quote, learned helplessness theory. So Martin Seligman did not have a track record of positivity. And so he gets up on the stage and he says, OK, we are going to change psychology. We're going to start this thing. We're going to call positive psychology. We're going to study joy and happiness and what strengthens people, strengthens people and what makes people well and healthy. The positive side of mental health, the real positive side of mental health, not just the absence of a mental disorder. And so they are the ones, Seligman and colleagues and others, created this evidence-based happiness, which they refer to as positive psychology interventions. I'm using evidence-based happiness. It's just a little different terminology that I think fits well with what we're trying to accomplish. So that's the history. Uh, and before we get into some of the other content that we're going to cover in this lecture... I want to ask, before we jump into the content, I want to ask, are you happy? 
And as soon as I ask that question, I want to tell you, that's a terrible question. Don't ask yourselves that. I mean, it's, it's really a ridiculous question because when we ask ourselves, am I happy? Or other people ask us if we're happy, it instantly causes this is uh, for us to go into rabbit holes around am i am i am i happy I, am i maybe i'm sad well happy sad that's a binary i mean it's there's much more to how we feel than that and sometimes when people even say well yeah i'm happy they then immediately feel fake like oh no maybe i'm just pretending to be happy so we really, I think, by asking ourselves directly, am I happy? It sort of sows the seeds of doubt around our mood and whether we're okay. And we're really not meant to be continuously monitoring our moods. We're meant to be engaged in life. We should be so engaged in life and in doing and thinking and feeling and loving and all those things that we do in life that we're not doing a lot of that self monitoring of am i okay am i feeling okay that actually that preoccupation for most people in most cases actually makes us feel worse and in fact as you all know although i've had teachers tell me this after the class i've had teachers tell me this they've they say um thank you so much for telling us that we don't have to be happy all the time and I'm like, you are welcome. Of course, we don't have to be happy all the time. We shouldn't be happy all the time. So I put together this little collage and I put it together. Uh, it was it was difficult for me because I hate all of these messages. I think all of these messages are ridiculous. And give me let me give you a, a couple of examples. I mean, the, the one in the top left hand corner. Are you happy or sad? Again, that's a binary that's ridiculous. As we know, binaries are really in many ways a silly way to make it so it's one thing or the other. Life is much more textured than that. Are you happy or sad? No, I'm actually neither. I'm something else. The one here that says no one can make you happy until you're happy with yourself. Oh, I hate that. It's just not true. In fact, it's so not true. You can see that it's an, it's by anonymous. Nobody would take credit for it because it's just a silly thing that they posted on the internet. Now, the one that really gets me is this one right here. Nothing is worth it if you aren't happy. That is completely false. One example out of my own life is that the last four or five years of his life, my father, before he died a couple years ago, was in, in terrible physical condition. He was uh, stuck, confi confined to bed rest. He, he'd been a very active guy. He was miserable. It was a super difficult time. It was hard to visit him. Uh, and, you know, he did his best to stay in a good mood. We'd play cards and pretty soon he couldn't track that. He could hardly track watching sports on television. He just got worse and worse. And it was miserable. Okay. And there's no way I would trade. There's no way I would trade the time that I spent with him. Uh, in fact, I think to myself, I wish I had spent more time with him, even though it was really difficult time. And that's the point, is that oftentimes some of the things that make us feel sadness or pain, that those can be the most meaningful things in life, right? Uh, I have to say, I just, I've been reading some of the homework that's starting to come in for the first unit of this course, and someone has already written to me what I think is a beautiful assignment, where she's telling me that she listens to a song that she has linked to the suffering and the death of her mother, and that listening to the song makes her cry, but they're cleansing and joyful tears. And that is exactly the point. We can have happy songs that make us smile and dance, and that's great. And there's no way we should stop doing that. On the other hand, we should have songs that deepen our sense of meaning and maybe help us to feel some of the hard, challenging emotions that we all naturally feel in our lives. And so 
In terms of defining happiness, the confession here is it's a little bit of a bait and switch tactic that we're using. We use evidence-based happiness in the title, but we're not talking about smiley happiness. We're not talking about what Aristotle would call, <clears throat> excuse me, what Aristotle would call hedonistic happiness or material happiness, that happiness that we feel, you know, when you get a new car, that's great. One of the problems with hedonistic happiness is that it doesn't last. The new car gets old. It doesn't last. The new romantic partner gets old or breaks up with you. They have even studied physical interventions like uh, weight loss and facelifts and all kinds of things like that. And they have found people feel better, happier for a little while, and then they go back down to their baseline. They refer to that as hedonic adaptation, meaning that we just get used to things. And so we may be happy for a while with some new material item or some personal achievement, but the personal achievement will only increase our mood for a somewhat limited period of time. In addition, there's a thing called opponent process theory of emotion. And what that means is we can only feel happy for so long. This is one of the reasons why people who, and kids who are too happy, and I'm sure you've been around little kids late at night when maybe they're really, really hyper and they're so happy and you know a crash is coming. It seems to be physically the way we're built. The same thing is true to some extent with depression. And that we know from observing people who are depressed over time that almost everyone becomes undepressed even without treatment. Now, treatment, of course, makes it faster, makes it more permanent. But it seems like our bodies come back to sort of this middle stable mood state somewhat naturally. Um, so... Another thing about defining happiness, we're, we're talking about this thing that, that um, Aristotle called eudaimonic happiness, which is a happiness that involves uh, daily practice of living well, of living well physically, psychologically, socially, spiritually, emotionally. It's more about meaning in your life and in your daily practices than it is about a smiley face. And I think the best definition for us, for educators, might be Aristotle's idea of that place where the flowering, right, the blooming of our own, our own unique, our own best virtues intersect with the needs of the world or the community or your family or your romantic partner, right? It's where that best, those best parts of you, your gifts, your skills, your talents, it's where you're making the most of them in the social and community situations that you're in. So that is a really nice, I think, definition of happiness. So a question I have for you as educators, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop out of this in a moment and see if we can have a short discussion about your experience of yourself and your own gifts that you bring to the classroom. <clears throat> but a quick story uh, in my experience, so I was in full-time private practice, like I told you for many years, and then I, I moved out of it. I was the director of Families First for about eight years, and then I got a job here at the University of Montana. And one time I was biking home, I'm biking up the Rattlesnake Hill, uh, and I hear someone coming behind me. Sure enough, it's it's this boy who I had seen in counseling about six or seven years previously. And I remember him and I say hello. And he says, hi, jo Dr. John, do you remember me? I say, yeah, of course I remember you. And, you know, we didn't really know what to say to each other. We're riding up a hill. We're both kind of out of breath. And I say, so, hey, what do you remember about what do you remember about our counseling? And he looked at me and he said, I remember that one time when you blew up a bunch of balloons and then we popped them, we stepped on them, we stomped on them in your office. Now, I have never blown up a balloon in my office, ever. He was completely wrong about the memory. 
I hate the sound of popping balloons. It sort of just freaks me out. I know I would never do that, but that's what he remembered. And then I, so I didn't tell him that, no, that's not right. But I just asked him, well, what else do you remember? And he said, you know what? I don't really remember very much, but what I remember is we had a good time together. He remembered the emotional feel of us doing counseling together. Now, for me, that was very meaningful. It sort of touched me because one of my goals in the work that I did and that I still sometimes do with young people was to have a good emotional experience, right? To be together and to have a positive emotional experience. So it was very fulfilling for me to hear him say that. So on the heels of that story, what I want you to think about now, and this is my, my assignment for us in this class session. And so if you're live with me, I'm going to bust out of this PowerPoint here in a moment and see if any of you will, will share something with me about your own gifts and how they manifest themselves in the classroom or in whatever role that you have in your school. But I want you, to, and I know this is awkward also, I know that that um, thinking about your virtues, your gifts, your skills and talents is not something that comes natural and talking about them in front of other people may even be more difficult. So I don't want to raise this bar too high, but I hope that we can embrace this awkward. So I'm not going to do break breakout rooms. We don't have enough people for that. And again, if you're just watching the video, I want you to be reflecting on this. What are some nice stories? What are some nice stories about you, about your strengths, about your gifts and skills and talents and virtues in the classroom or in the counselor's office or whatever your context is in schools? So uh, I hope someone will share something. I'm going to break out of this PowerPoint now. Um, and I also hope that for those of you who are just listening, that you'll get a chance to post some of your reactions to this assignment. I hope you get a chance to post some of them on the discussion board. Ryder, I can see you. Hello. I'm happy to talk. I just turned on my camera because I know what it is to be in those trainings and everybody's got their camera off and you're like, am I, is this tracking or am I totally off base? So I thought I'd offer yeah. that gift back to you. So thank you for, thank you for having your camera on. And Liz is with us too, with her camera on. Uh, and so um, either of you want to share something about uh, the way in which you think, um, and this might be related to what, how people see you or how your students perceive you, um, ways in which that you've maybe built some reputation in school. Um, what are some things that you do that you think represent you and that it really works well in your academic, in your school setting? Liz, would you like to go first? I'm happy to if you don't want to, though. Why don't you go? I'm still thinking. Okay. All right, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, and it, it's not, I, it's, I've dealt with this my whole life. It's it's actually Ryder, um, but not consequential at all. Because I've been Roger, Ryan. It's weird. Ryder's a weird name. Oh, Ryder. Uh, oh, I'm so, sorry. Ah. No, don't don't apologize. It's all good. Trust me, it's just, it's hard to make the association a writer. Um, so yeah, I guess when you ask the question in terms of like looking at abundance or strengths, I would say, you know, people have commented to me passion, you know, and, and, and a certain degree of, of shared purpose. I'll, I'll punt this your way because I hung out with her this weekend, uh, Adria Lawrence. Uh, we did a training to the leadership team for cognitively based compassion training uh, the executive team and, you know, afterwards getting feedback from the the leadership team. And that was on August 12th and 13th here at the university. Um, they were grateful. And I, I think part of that, you know, I don't have any special skills or knowledge or competencies in this area, but I do believe in it, you know, and, I, and I'm able to carry that and hold that with a sense of shared passion and commitment, partially because I've seen the benefit it's had for my own life um, as a, as an education leader. So yeah, I, I guess I can look at that and say, okay, that's, that's a attribute or quality I can bring to the table. 
That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And I, and I, I love the story and that you were able to use that, that virtue of being passionate. Um, in it sounds like teaching about compact, cognitive, com compassionate, Tell me more. What yeah, that sorry. Was it's just the, the the training that we did with the leadership team, and I work for Emory University, but I got my doctorate at UM as well. Yeah, is a cognitively based compassion training. Perfect. All right, that is wonderful. In fact, I think I might have looked you up ahead of time because I saw that somebody had an Emory um, email address, and my younger daughter went to Emory for her undergrad, uh, and we went to Emory, and we. Um, we went to one of those seminars that the Dalai Lama did, uh, which was quite memorable. Uh, so thank you, writer. Appreciate it. How about you, Liz? All right. So now I have to follow that. Um, <laughs> um, I have uh, math can be really hard for kids. It, they have traumas that they're bringing in. They have history from previous schools, previous teachers. Uh, so I always felt that math was hard enough without having a teacher that was mean. <laughs> so my goal is kind of to just be a kind um, understanding, maybe too understanding sometimes. But um, I recently found my student teaching stuff because I still had it. And I was noticing in some of my evals from one of my teachers just that I was very kind to the students and I made them feel comfortable. And um, I had an absolutely amazing group of students last year, just absolutely phenomenal. Um, a bunch of them wrote me thank you letters, which this, these are high school kids, which tells yeah. you something. Yeah, that's cool. A lot of them were just like, thank you so much for the time that you put in. Thank you for being understanding. And it, it was kind of nice to get that feedback too that, you know, I, I want to make my classroom a welcoming and safe place, but that's not always possible. So the fact that kids felt strongly enough to write me a thank you letter and comment in it um, said a lot to me. So I'm trying and I, I think it's helping. So just being understanding. Yeah. yeah. And I, I love, I love that, Liz. I mean, I love that you are a kind and Let's gentle <laughs> A kind, I try to be a kind and gentle math teacher, right? So, and you, you know, you talked about a safe room, a safe classroom. And um, so way back in 1924, there was a woman named Mary Cover Jones who did some of the earliest research ever on how do we help children through their fears? How do we help children get rid of their fears and their anxieties? And, and the finding was true then and it is the foundation of all anxiety treatment. And I'm, I'm sharing this because, of course, math and math anxiety go hand in hand. So, But what she found was that she used a thing and she called counter conditioning. And counter conditioning is the presentation of a comforting stimulus, a soothing stimulus, at the same time to pair with the anxiety provoking stimulus, right? So for, for many students, not all, but for many students in math, math itself is an anxiety pro, you know, producing stimulus, right? And so what I hear you doing is so good. It's like you become the counter conditioning, soothing, comforting stimulus in your students' lives. And so at the very least, over time, they begin to feel comfortable coming into a classroom that's going to focus on math, even though it's going to focus on math, because you, I think, and probably have made your whole classroom, this kind of comforting stimulus that helps them to just get balanced out and feel more emotionally regulated than they would otherwise just faced with math. So. I try. Yes. And I guess yeah, so my, cool. other, so my other goal was, um, when I kids graduated, because then when I was at my small school, I had them grade seven through 12. Yeah. Um, they might not like math when they graduated. They didn't have to like it, but I didn't want them to hate it. And I didn't want them to be afraid of it. Yeah. You know, if yeah, I think that's such a great goal, right? I mean, they may not get A's, right? They may not become math whizzes, 
but to get them comfortable with it um, and get them to not hate it. That's a huge accomplishment. So thank you. And thank you, Ryder, for helping our leadership team at the University of Montana. I think things are going to be all better there now. Yeah, make you know, sure you tell Adria that. Tell Adria. Yeah, I don't know if Seth was there. Tell Seth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. just tell him, hey, it's dialed. You've got Be the sure training. to tell Seth in particular. Yeah, tell him. That, I that, do John, it. that John Summers Flanagan said, Yeah. we hope this fixed things. Yeah, this is going to fix everything definitively. <laughs> You know, as we all know, nothing fixes things definitively, but progress, right? But movement, but heading in the right direction, that is so important. And so I will bet, Ryder, that you got them, you got them moving in the right direction. So cool. All right. So for those of you who may just be watching this as a video, uh, I hope you were able to hear Ryder and Liz and the amazing, really nice stories that they told about their own talents and how their talents, passion and kindness and gentleness really has been manifest in their classrooms to the benefit of people who learn from them. The same is true for you. Uh, and so I hope that you'll share some of your own reflections about that. I'm going to show now a short video. I don't show a lot of videos, but this one is uh, presented by a woman named Dr. Sonia Lyo Bomersky. Now, Dr. Sonia, as I like to call her, is one of the most prolific researchers of all on the topic of positive psychology and positive psychology interventions. And so she's gonna talk briefly about the science of what determines happiness. Can you hear that, Ryder? What two of my colleagues, uh, Ken Sheldon and David Shkadi, and I did is we developed a theory that sort of answers this question of what, is, what are the most important determinants of happiness. And the theory is in the form of a pie chart, so it's very kind of simple, easy to understand. Um, and so uh, this is very simplistic. Basically, I'm going to give you some numbers that are averages and approximations of, from many past studies. These numbers are not set in stone. They're just approximations. So approximately 50% of the variance in happiness is due to our genes. So when you look at all the people sitting in this room today, and uh, if you ask the question, why are some of you happier than others, about 50% of the answer lies in genetics. So some of you just have uh, sort of happier genes, so to speak. Um, about 10% lies in our life circumstances. So, and again, it may be 10. Some studies show it's 18, 20, 8, 12. Um, and so this means that um, we all differ in our life circumstances. Some of us are richer, some of us are poorer, some of us are you know, more or less attractive, more or less healthy. Um, and so that does play a factor in happiness, play a part in our happiness, but not as big as you'd expect. In fact, a lot of people are astonished to see that number being so small. They think that, oh, I'll be happier when you know, I achieve more positive circumstances in my life, when I get a new job, or when I get a boyfriend, when I have a baby. Um, but the truth is those things don't affect our happiness as much as we think they will. And so that leaves 40% of happiness. Again, that number shouldn't be set in stone, but sort of a quite a large number um, that is under our control, under our power to change. And so my book and my work is really about how do we harness that 40%? What is it that we can do um, by the ways that we think, the ways that we behave in our daily lives that can affect our happiness level? By the way, both um, in terms of going up and going down too. We certainly can also do things that decrease our happiness levels below our set points or below our baselines. Okay, so um, one thing that researchers have done is they've looked at what happy people do. So they study happy people. So you find a group of people who are really happy, who are really sort of successful at being happy, and you, you want to find out what is their secret? What is it that they're doing? And actually, this is something that I uh, started my career studying. Um, and so research shows that happy people are really good at relationships. Um, they, if you look at the happiest people, they all have 
really stable, fulfilling relationships, partnerships, uh, friends, even with their pets, they have good relationships. Um, okay, so happier people are more grateful. Happier people are more helpful and philanthropic. Um, happier people tend to be more optimistic about the future. Um, they are more likely to live in the present. So again, this is sort of studying people who are already happy. What do they behave? What do they, how do they think? Um, they tend to savor pleasures in their life. Um, they make physical activity a habit. They're often spiritual or religious. Spirituality and religion aren't a prerequisite for happiness, but it is correlated with happiness. And happier people are deeply committed to, to goals. They have significant, meaningful life goals that they're pursuing, whether it's raising moral children or building a house or advancing in their careers. Um, now, of course, these are correlational studies, so we don't really know. But I used to be, uh, journalists used to call me often in these days when I did this kind of research, and they would ask me, well, what, what can we tell our readers about what they can do to become happier? And I'd often say, well, I don't know, because just because a happy person does something doesn't mean that if we do what they do, we're going to be happier, because it's just a correlational finding. And then I started thinking and realizing that actually the question of how to become happier is a really interesting scientific question, um, and that we could actually try to test that in the lab uh, by doing experiments. All right. That was Dr. Sonia. That was Dr. Sonia, and you can see here we've replicated her pie chart and made a little image of it. A number of things to remember. Um, well, the first thing is that, as she said, the numbers are approximation. And it could be that for one person, it might be that it's really 60% of your happiness is determined by your intentional activities. And only 30% seem to be driven by genetic uh, predispositions. And um, so it's really important to remember it's very, it varies based on individuals. It varies to some extent based on cultures and countries. Um, but it's, it's a nice general guideline. The other thing that I have found is that people have different reactions to these numbers. Some people say, wow, 40%? That is amazing. That gives us so much power over our happiness. And other people will look at the pie chart differently and they'll say, oh no, you mean 50% is locked in? That I can't do anything about 50%? And so people will have different reactions and it'd be interesting you know, to track your own reaction. A lot of the content not all, but a significant amount of the content in our course is based on Dr. Sonia's book, The How of Happiness, which I just pulled off my bookshelf. You can see there her pie is right there on the cover. It was it's it's from way back in 2007. It is still one of the best books there are out there on happiness. It's one of the self-help books that actually gets reasonably good ratings as well, this is science-based and it actually could help you feel better. Later on, she made more reflections because people, you know, they would oversimplify her findings. And so she had to push out messages over and over again. And you can hear it in this video that she's really trying to say, it's a, it's an, this whole thing is an oversimplification and that the main point she's trying to make is that people can change their subjective experience of happiness based on a number of different a possible menu of specific intentional behaviors and that that's possible um so now we're going to shift to this class i'm going to go over the assignments and then we're going to stop for today. <clears throat> so this class, we're going to steadily focus on you, on your unique strengths, your talents, your virtues, your virtues, and your gifts. I know that's awkward. We're also going to explore the evidence-based approaches that are out there for cultivating eudaimonic happiness. Some of the assignments will be simpler, like music and mood, and others will be deeper. And we have an assignment later in the semester on forgiveness. And that's a harder one, but it's also related to happiness. 
And so as you consider these assignments and the readings and the videos that we will assign for you to uh, experience, we hope that you will also be contemplating or considering the ways in which you could weave that into your work as an educator. We don't want to require that because one of the foundations of this class is to give you choices and to let you choose what works best for you. That will be true with regard to the positive psychology interventions or evidence-based happiness practices that we assign to you. But it's also true, we don't want to force you into applying this into the in the classroom or in your work. But if you want to, that's great. And we would love for you to do that. <clears throat> there will be lots of small assignments. And the assignments are just designed because we know it takes people a while to develop new habits. It's really to give you a number of weeks, just orient your, orienting yourself toward these specific happiness practices, weaving them into your life and seeing how it affects you. In every case, the message we want to give you is that each of the active learning assignments is an experiment. It's a personal experiment for you, on you, that you get to evaluate. You may decide, and there are 14 different active learning assignments, you may decide you hate 12 of them. But you might discover that two of them have some really nice effects on you. And that's something that you may want to hang on to and keep in your life after the class ends. So we're, we, we organize the class a little bit into these different, these seven different dimensions. There'll be lectures and uh, podcasts and videos and readings in each of these seven areas, emotional, happiness, cognitive, or mental happiness, social or interpersonal happiness, physical happiness, uh, contextual or ecological happiness, behavioral happiness, and spiritual or cultural happiness. So we'll be focusing on those different dimensions. Uh, for some people, you may find something in the cognitive dimension to be especially useful for you, because maybe that's one of the challenges that you face. For others, it might be getting out into nature and sort of changing the context of your daily experience so that you have some different things that you're around in your life and in your day-to-day -day living. So syllabus overview, I mentioned at the beginning, Moodle. Moodle can be a challenge. Moodle is a gift, right? We get to do this on the Moodle platform. You will find your daily assignments each unit, daily, weekly, <laughs> um, each unit, the assignments and the readings are in a different section on Moodle, starting with section one, week one, day one. If you get confused, if you get disoriented or you get too happy, uh, you know, check in with us for clarification. Uh, you will not be alone in your questions. Every time, and and this happens, and it's most of the time, it's user error. I make a mistake, and then you all notice it, and somebody emails me, and I fix it. Uh, and I will try to fix it as quickly as I can and respond as quickly as I can. But I do know I make mistakes, and there also are some quirks in Moodle that make it challenging. First assignment, I've already kind of mentioned these. Oh, wait. Yeah, I haven't mentioned this. So... This course, as I mentioned, is underwritten by a grant from the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation, uh, located in Atlanta. And um, we're collecting pre- and post-course data so that we can report on it to them and possibly publish it. And so we ask people to incorporate taking these questionnaires at the beginning and the end of class as an assignment. You get 20 points for each one. We also want to emphasize that the this is not a required assignment. Uh, you can switch it out for something else because we don't want anyone to feel coerced into filling out these questionnaires. 
we do want you to do it, but we don't want you to feel coerced into it. So hopefully you've gotten online. I know 14 of you have already finished the first happiness assessment, and I hope the rest of you get a chance to do that. Again, if you don't want to, there will be plenty of substitute assignments that you could use instead to earn the 40 points that you might otherwise earn on this assignment. <clears throat> this second assignment is really the core of the class. There are 14 active learning assignments that we consider to be experiments that you conduct on yourself. Now, this course can be organized in different ways. One time we did it in 20 days. Sometimes we do it over 15 weeks. Other times it's somewhere in the middle. Um, but unit by unit, there will be an active learning assignment. Each one will be worth 10 points. You post your assignment in the little Dropbox in Moodle. When you click on the Dropbox, it will describe the assignment so that you can read the instructions. The assignments are just graded pass or not pass. Um, we just give everyone 10 points for making a reasonable effort at completing the assignment. The point is that you experiment with the assignment in one way or another. You could do all 14 of these assignments and get 140 points, or you could do 10 and get 100. Or if there are some you don't want to do, you could do eight of them and then make up the points in other assignments in other ways. So um, we would like you to do most of these assignments. Um, and the guideline is to do 10 of them, 10 points each, make 100 points. The third assignment is uh, one that is based on the research finding that when we talk about our experiences around these evidence-based happiness practices. When we talk about those experiences with other people, it deepens the experience. It's also good for the other person to hear about it and that we learn more about ourselves and how to apply these particular assignments or practices in our lives. So during the first two to three units of this class, we're gonna be doing, uh, we're gonna be using the Moodle discussion board. You'll click in there, you can post something about your own experience, uh, and ideally you'll post twice about your experiences. For your first post, you could talk about your reactions to this video lecture, or you could write about your, and maybe both, you would write about what are your own talents and skills and gifts that you uh, that manifest in the classroom or with your students. You also will make comments on the posts of others. And so the first two to three weeks or the two to three units in this, in this particular format, you'll make two posts about yourself and six posts, I mean, four posts about other people or comments on other people. <laughs> we're not posting about other people, we're commenting on their posts. I have loved the discussions that, um, that emerge from the, experiences that you have in this class. And so I'm looking forward to reading those. Um, but by the end of the second or third week or unit, um, we want you to choose a class discussion partner. Maybe you will have met them through the discussion board. Maybe you'll need to somehow get an email from us and we'll ask people if we can match them. And we want you to engage in another six additional hours of conversation over the course of the semester about these assignments. Or alternatively, and we've had a number of teachers take up this particular option, we can pair you, we can match you with the University of Montana master's student in counseling, and they can meet with you for what we call six individual happiness consultations. Uh, those can be scheduled via Zoom, and it's private, uh, it's confidential, and we don't want, I don't want to know the details of any of those things, but you do need to send me a message every couple of weeks or post every couple of weeks in the assignment, um, maybe summarize some things that you've talked about um, that you feel comfortable sharing. So that is assignment three, <clears throat> two parts, the discussion board part is worth 20 points. 
the class partner or the happiness consultant is worth 60 points. The fourth assignment is the lesson plan. Uh, because most of you have a role as a classroom teacher, uh, we'd like you to pick a topic from the class, or maybe you're a school counselor, or maybe you have an administrative position, but pick a topic from class and think about how you might turn it into or transform it into something that you use in your role in the school. Now, this could be a formal lesson plan, or it could be some other thing. Uh, we're asking for three to five pages worth 40 points. We don't need a ton of details, but we'd like to hear about how, if you so choose, you might weave these ideas into the school that you're working. So we have a lesson plan outline that you can use, or you can just use whatever you have or whatever you like. And so the fifth assignment is kind of a, it's historically people think it's really fun. Uh, I've done it so many times, I'm not sure that I think it's fun anymore, but maybe it is. But during the last week of class, I will I will host, I will be your host, I'll wear a hat and I'll have a drink, but it will be non-alcoholic. And I will do a pub style happiness quiz live, happiness trivia. It will be a review of all the content of the semester. And you can win prizes if you participate live, but you don't have to because the course can be taken completely asynchronously. You can always watch the happiness pub quiz after it happens. You don't have to participate. This last semester, we had the most vigorous, this summer, we had the most vigorous participation ever in the happiness pub quiz. It was hilarious. Uh, and we have a number of bizarre rules and it's basically whoever can type in the right answer quickest and uh, we also give points for bizarre answers or funny answers. And so we try to have a good time. And uh, also it's a review of the content of the course. Uh, you'll get more instructions on that toward the end of the semester as we get closer to it. So now the sixth thing is you can just do more active learning assignments. You could do more consultation sessions. You could do a second lesson plan. One of the points of this course is we do not want to tell you what you should do. We want to give you a menu of what you can do and for you to try it out. Obviously, you have to do a certain amount of things. If you're taking the course for credit or no credit, there are 290 possible points. You will need to get 203 points in order to get a credit, get the three credits, graduate credits from the University of Montana. If you're taking it for a letter grade, because some districts require that, uh, there is the, the letter grading scale is in the syllabus. And so you'll be able to track your, your grade that way. And I'm happy to communicate with you about where you stand in the course. All right. Summary and conclusions. These are just some boxes that kind of review where what we've talked about in this particular lecture. Positive psychology had a slow start. Uh, it's pretty natural for most of us to focus on negativity. It often takes intentionality and effort and dedication to really focus on things that are more positive. Too much focus on monitoring our mood can backfire. We're using the definition of eudaimonic happiness, which is much more of a, of a daily practice that focuses on meaning and I'm going to give you one more anecdote about what eudaimonic happiness is all about. We have found and the research supports that happiness interventions and practices can benefit teachers. We've had really good outcomes in the course that we're teaching, and we're super excited about that. Turns out, as Dr. Sonia said, approximately 40% of eudaimonic happiness can change based on our intentional behaviors. And again, the class is partially experiential, partially academic, with lots of small assignments to keep you oriented toward trying to implement these practices in your life. Homework reminder, first couple of assignments are music and mood and goal setting. Uh, hopefully you'll get in there and do that happiness assessment right away if you haven't already done it. 
There are readings, there are podcasts, there's videos, there's discussion posts. <clears throat> For week two, there's some amazing readings and a podcast um, that really will help you with the idea of forming new habits and making changes in your life. And, and the, and the focus is on goal setting. And I think it's a, it's a really, I think, effective way for us to start to change the way we think about our habitual behaviors. So one last anecdote, and I will end. Uh, there's a famous psychologist named Christopher Peterson. He was from the University of Michigan. And he uh, passed away a number of years ago, but he used to go around and give lots of positive psychology lectures. And he would say to people, um, you know, you can come to my hour long lecture. I can just tell you right now in five seconds, the whole, I can summarize the whole point of positive psychology and happiness. And people would of course say, well, tell us, tell us Dr. Peterson. And he would say, other people matter, period. End of lecture. He came, he, he, he eventually also added to that and he would say other people matter and we are all other people to everyone else. For me, that captures the communal, the social, the relational nature, like Dr. Sonia said, of happiness. It is very interpersonal. And oftentimes we benefit more by being with and helping others than from being helped ourselves. But often the best relationships are, are mutually supportive and reciprocal in the way that people interact and support each other. So I love that definition. I love the summary that Christopher Peterson gives we will talk about that off and on this semester, that really the point of this class is your well-being, you living a meaningful life that feels right to you, and you sharing your talents and gifts in positive ways with other people in your lives. So that is the end of this lecture, but... As we like to do, I have a closing song, which I'm just going to play. Anyone who is tuned in can log off if you want or listen to the song. The best part of this song 